Hello and welcome to yet another episode of EAO's Just Ask, your monthly live appointment with a leading expert in implant dentistry. My name is Gerrit Heikoop, and in this live video session, we aim to answer all your question, questions about digital implantology. And to do so tonight, I'm joined by Andre Chen, who is an assistant professor in uh, oral surgery and implant dentistry at the University of Lisbon, and who also is a medical dentist and an oral surgery specialist in his own private practice. Andre, good evening. Hello, good evening, Garrett. I'm glad you're uh, joining us. And like always, I have asked our audience in the live chat to kind of get a vibe together to let us know who you are and where you're watching us from. And we already see that quite a lot of fun people are doing that, like Sanya Ranshot, who's joining us from Cape Town in South Africa. Good evening, Sanya. Beatrice Sanchez is originally from Nottingham in the UK, but joining us from Spain. Christopher Affokist, good to have you back again. He's, uh, he's been a regular participant from Sweden. Philip Breguin, good evening, bon, uh, bonsoir. Michael Pouillet is with us, good luck, André, he says. Manuel mm -hmm. Reinis from Austria, Teresa Cavallo from Stockholm, Mitchell Pierce from New Orleans, wow. Good afternoon and welcome for joining us as well. This is how it works. We're gonna talk about digital implantology and you can submit as many questions as you can via the live chat here on the site. And I will uh, bring them to Andre. But before we start, Andre, there's something special tonight. Those who have been following the EO closely on the social media channels might have picked it up and otherwise you hear it here first. Please take note, save the date, October 5 to 11 for the EO Digital Days. This means seven days of exclusive scientific content, including four evenings of live interactive shows where you can participate just like you can tonight. And for up-to-date EEO members, this is entirely free. And we have something new this year, a specific EEO digital day member rate. If you sign up for that, you get access to the event and much more. So make sure you block your calendars or at least the evenings, European time, October 5 to 11. Well, Andre, uh, we'll get back to that in a little bit. We'll probably be talking about digital implantology on that meeting as well. Yes. But for tonight, let's start with setting the boundaries of this topic and setting the definition. Digital implantology, what are we talking about tonight? Well, Gary, thank you for the question. Uh, but before I answer, just, just let me uh, thank you some, some people. Uh, I would like to First, to thank you to the European Academy of Oslo Integration for the kind invitation to be here. I've been following the, the last uh, Just Ask sessions and the people that were involved are amazing. I follow that closely. It was amazing. So for me, it's an honor to be here and speaking about a topic that I love so much, that is uh, digital implantology in uh, implant dentistry. Uh, and obviously, uh, that is a question that uh, you know a lot of people ask me. This, uh, I mean, digital implantology is a broad is a broad theme. It sounds uh, very broad, eh? yeah. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's touching every every part of, of of dentistry, not only in implant dentistry, but also in in other areas, from prosthodontics to endodontics to to, to every part. Uh, we are going to focus now here a little bit on the uh, surgical guides and the surgical procedures of implant dentistry. And I think uh, we have already, a, it's a nice topic for this hour. And uh, so we'll be focusing on that and hope we get a lot of questions of people about that topic. Yeah. So um, to get us started, can you, can you help me to get a little overview of, of where we are with digital implant? How, how does it compare to the analog way of working and, and what does it mean when we go into surgery? Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm going to share the screen now. Okay. So yeah. we, can, uh, we can all see the presentation. And so, uh, well, uh, first of all, I've, I'm from Lisbon, Portugal, as you mentioned. So, uh, you know, if everyone is uh, watching us, I hope uh, I hope they are safe, uh, whatever each each country they are in, because we live uh, very different times with uh, you know all these pandemic things. So I hope that when all of this is over, everyone is inviting to to Lisbon. As you mentioned, I'm from the University of Lisbon, College of Dentistry. I've been there for 15 years, and uh, the reason that uh, we are here is because, as you mentioned. Digital implantology is touching uh, everywhere in dentistry. And in implant dentistry, it's touching all the faces of an implant-supported rehabilitation, you know, from the diagnostic tools, 
you know, to, to surgery procedure, to prosthodontic procedures, whatever you look now, every, everything is digital. So uh, the thing is that in a lot of presentations and in, in a lot of uh, uh, chats that you see nowadays, uh, you normally are uh, seeing the before and after, right? But you forget that, you know, in the middle, in the middle, there's a lot of things that going on. I mean, Garrett, you, when you see this, you already have a lot of just ask sessions in each <laughs> photo. I mean, I, I, I recognize a lot yeah. of pictures. Yeah. You have a just ask session on bone regeneration and soft tissue uh, or soft tissue grafting. You, you had your salary in fixed prosthodontics, uh, a, a very nice discussion that you had. Uh, so all, all of, within the implant dentistry, in almost all phases of an implant supported uh, treatment, you have the introductions of these new tools in the new generation of, uh, of digital dentistry. Of course, you, by, by, by you can pick uh, 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 any phase of this implant supported rehabilitation and talk about how digital evolved in this situation, the outcomes, how do you are treatment planning this patient, how you are using digital technology to achieve better outcomes for the patient. But mm -hmm. here, in this session, we're going to focus here. We're going to focus on how are we transmitting all this information that we plan, you know, to a surgical guide, whatever type of surgical guide it is, but it can bring the information of what we perfectly plan to the mouth of our patient. Uh, and we're going to speak about the outcomes. We're going to speak about the problems that we have still and probably indications of its of its surgical guide. So it's it's here, it's in this arena that we'll be uh, spending the next uh, 50 to 55 minutes. Interesting, interesting. And uh, we're very curious to learn from you in that. Um, let me just welcome everybody who's just jo uh, joined in. I see some more shout outs from uh, Arthur Philippe Simoes, Said Rajouli from uh, Marseille in France, Adam Dupuis is joining us, Bonsoir as well, Victor Pallery from uh, the last session from Moldova. Good to have you back, Victor. And we also see Elena tuning in from Venezuela. Now, Andre, what are some of the highlights of the digital dentistry for you personally? Well, uh, digital dentistry in what relates to the surgical guides and the production of, of surgical guides have been involved tremendous in the last two or three years. I mean, it evolved because, you know, we have new tools, new digital protocols, new digital technologies that are evolving, you know, each six months we have something new. So uh, it's exciting time. But on the other hand, um, we cannot forget uh, that we still have that classic implantology. We have to confront that with evidence-based research. We need to know our data if all of these technologies are working in the mouths of the patient. So mm -hmm. in, in, in order to integrate all of these uh, into a surgical guide, we have to remember that the surgical guide uh, has to bring the information on biology, biomechanics and aesthetics. It's a three main core of an implant supported rehabilitation. And obviously it, every implant supported rehabilitation is a prosthodontic driven therapy. So wh when you ask me the highlights, the highlights that we are dealing now in 2020, it's the ability of having uh, uh, more, power, more powerful softwares to, uh, to do a correct treatment plan. So we have the introduction, for example, of the facial scanner. The facial scanners uh, have brought a new dimension to the, the communication between uh, the dentist and the lab technicians and eventually the patient itself. So if you want to address you know, all of those three things, for example, the aesthetic part, you can now see in the three-dimensional view, you know, the position, the aesthetic part of uh, what you what you are programming to do in that patient. So I think it's it's a major breakthrough that you can now plan in the third dimension, and obviously, then you can, after you know what the position of your teeth are in relation to the face of the patient, to the aesthetic part, then you can start to translate that information directly to where your bone is in relation to the teeth that you program to the patient, and have all these uh, you know digital. Uh, program that allows you to build a surgical guide. And obviously, these are the highlights that we have nowadays. It's the ability of having all of these tools in your own office. And by doing that, you know, having, having better control 
of the treatment plan of the patient. And now afterwards, it's, it's after you have planning, you can obviously do your treatment plan, do your cases in a more controlled situation, you know, for, for you to place an implant after you have all these treatment plan combined and all of these tools combined, you have a, a better sense and a better prognosis of where your implant should be in relation to the teeth of the patient. And in that way, you know, allow the patient to have a better treatment plan. And so I think what we have now, I mean, you, you, you had a lot of uh, just asked questions that, you know, the outcomes of guided bone regeneration, tremendous importance, the soft tissue uh, predictability, amazing. But, you know, if you place the implant in the wrong position, <laughs> well, uh, there's not much that you can do because if you place the, the implants too labial, you probably have a lot of recessions. And if you put the implant too palatal, you start to have problems in speech and something like that. So when you reach the situation and you send this word to the lab technician, the lab technician will, uh, you know, will say thank you and will build probably the best situation for that patient. And not only, you know, in terms of treatment plan and the treatment itself, you know, it's, it, it may become better, but also the long-term maintenance, you know, the, the last, the last just as session that you had on perimplantitis uh, was amazing. And if you're, we are not giving the conditions for the patient, you know, to maintain those implants, then, then we have a problem. So I think it touches everything uh, from treatment planning to implant placement. So the 3D position of the implant carries now a lot more information that the freehand procedures that we were doing, uh, you know, uh, 10 to 12 years ago. So I think it's a major breakthrough. And not only uh, we can obviously uh, do the treatment better, but the controlling methods for investigation purposes, also the digital tools are here that make more uh, sense in terms of, uh, you know, knowing the outcomes of uh, all of these treatments that you're doing in implant dentistry. So I think this uh, is coming to help you a lot. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're making a great case. It's obvious that you are very, very excited. And it's also clear that you have done your homework. You've almost now mentioned all the other Just Ask sessions. Let me just uh, quickly explain for those viewers who are just tuning in, and this might be your first Just Ask session. Well, as the title explains, Just Ask. Use the uh, live chat box here on the uh, right side of your screen to submit any questions that you have on digital implantology. I will uh, take them in and read them out to Andre just by the order they come in. And in this way, we make most use of the fact that we are live, that Andre is live with us and that this whole community is live with us. We've seen in other just asked that people start to share their experiences as well. So uh, I invite you all to do that because if you don't ask, you never get to know. <laughs> now, with all this excitement, Andre, um, are we in fact better off? Where, where are we in terms of science? Well, uh, in terms of science, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, I think then that we get very excited with the new toys. It's always like this. And I mean, we're dentists. I mean, if something new and exciting comes out, we're the first to say, let's use it. But then you need to be careful because, you know, you really have to know if all of this new technology is become you a better dentist? Are you more accurate in doing your, your implants? Are you having, you know, 100% of success rate in every implant that you place with guided surgery? Are there any complications with that? And, and we have still uh, some problems that, uh, that doesn't make these 100%, uh, uh, you know, success cases with digital implantology. But if you ask me on the treatment level, I think on the treatment level, we are much better. Meaning that when we have to do a treatment plan for a patient, you know, one of the big differences that I always, uh, you know, tell to people is that on a, an analogic, not analogic, but on, on the traditional treatment plan, imagine if you have a problem that you're having a missing tooth or you want to place an implant, you know, traditionally, uh, I was trying to send the message to the lab technician. You had a problem and I was trying to communicate with the lab technician by saying, you know, he has this form of tools, he has this form of, or he has this color, but always, you know, not uh, together. I still had to pass the message for the lab technician who had to pass with me. But with digital uh, information and with digital treatment plans, 
what happens is actually, if you have a problem, me and the lab technicians are sitting there together, placing information on the computer, which is very different because now we're both engaged on the treatment plan. We both have to share this information for the computer. And I think it works much better in the communication. There's not an intermediary between, between both, just us and the computer. And then, and then obviously, we are gonna try to place you as a patient on a virtual level so we can start to share information to the different devices. If you need a surgical guide, I will probably send it to a 3D printer. If you need a crown, I will send it to the CAD CAM machine. But it's all centered now in the information that the computer receives. In, and, and on the treatment plan, it has, it has a, a, a lot of value. And I think that, uh, that uh, we, uh, we ha are doing a good job. But exactly. on the other hand, on the other hand, when you want to know the outcomes, for example, what is the outcome of an implant that is placed with digital technology, then the story uh, changes a little bit, okay? Then the story this, is, this, this is nice because this is exactly the question that Anhum Yadun, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from Pakistan is just uh, actually sending in. He's asking how the digital implantology affects the prognosis as compared to the conventional one. And I think you're about to share more about that. Yes, I mean, I, I'm gonna assume that the conventional one is the one that uh, you're going freehand without okay. any device, okay? Uh, well, in, in that case, uh, it affects a lot because uh, what you have to think is that when you go to the literature, uh, you know, you're, com you're controlling fully digital workflows uh, and, and the control group is probably what you plan on a software. So you plan something on a software, you place the implant, and then you go going to see if this implant matches this software, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're doing like this, you're, you're always uh, losing because, you know, to be completely accurate from what you plan, it's, it's, it's still not, not possible at these days. But if your control group is not what you plan on the computer, but it's your free hand, okay? then digital implantology will beat you because you know, you're know you much more accurate with a surgical guide than with a free hand. And there are a lot of articles that have that as a control group. And they clearly stated that if you're in free hand, the probability of you having a, a deviation from what you plan is much higher. So under those circumstances, always a surgical guide, okay? So. Yeah, so so it's important to understand because I've I've been also hearing these metrics of like uh, in in research fifty percent of the uh, guided uh, surgery is not accurate, but it, it's very important that you refer to what you are comparing to. Yes, it's, it's yes. not as accurately compared to the plan, but it's not as compared to freehand. Yes, yes. Uh, most of the of the uh, of the you know research that you have on digital implantology, especially with guides have this problem that is shown on this slide. I mean, uh, because of uh, the digital tools evolve, evolve at the speed of light. I mean, you have, for example, software 2.0, but six months after you have software 3.0 that has, is much more accurate. So the problem is that when you're researching something that six months is obsolete, then uh, you kind of lose track of what we are studying here. But yeah. I think, uh, but besides that, I think that we should investigate and you should have data on that because that will help you obviously to understand what you're doing. So what you mentioned, 50% means, you know, uh, when you plan an implant, and I think I have the next slide here, uh, for example, what you plan according to the, 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 the planning that you did on the software and then what you have on the mouse of the patient, there's a lot of devi deviations in almost all aspects of the implant on the apex, on the coronal portion, on the body, on the angle. And some of these parameters, uh, you know, they have no, no clinical impact for the patient because it's 0 0.3, 0 0.4. But for example, in the depth of the implant, it means the apical coronal position of the implant. If you are, for example, 0 0.5, supercrestal when you should be crestal or if you're if you're crestal instead of being two millimeters infracrestal that may have a direct not a direct but any, any direct impact on the on the long-term survival of this implant because mm. as you as you know on the last just ask you know the peri-implant maintenance is very important so if you're failing on these parameters you maybe have a problem now uh 
what we do right now is that we have a, a huge investigation, try to come out with the best uh, digital flow possible for these mm -hmm. things uh, go 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 very go very smooth. So, if if you look at the evolution of uh, of all these parameters, and and I like this because uh, you know you sometimes read the systematic review that is with tremendous importance, uh, but then uh, with digital, because digital is all evolving, is becoming better, it should be expected that the results would also uh, become better, okay? So, yeah. but you know, you have from 2009 to 2012, a small, a small increase on the, on the deviation, small increase meaning that you're becoming better, lowest values of deviations, but still, they carry uh, a little bit of mistake, okay? A little bit of, of error. So uh, in, in all, all parameters, but for example, on the depth, on the depth performance of the implant, meaning that apical coronal part of the implant, if you see the uh, new uh, articles from 2020, you see that depth is a problem that is almost on the tenth of a millimeter, which which is which is, in some cases, I think it's clinically acceptable. It's not wrong. I think it's it's uh, we we are becoming better uh, with the, with this digital technology, but still, you know, all the systematic reviews. Since 2009, say clearly that watch out because if you're under vital structures as the inferior alveolar nerve or the maxillary sinus, you should give at least two millimeters of you know leeway space in case of you have an error of your gut. And I think uh, we are becoming better, but we're still not not completely perfect with the, with this uh, with this static guided surgery. Exactly. Well, and I, I think that is uh, a nice segue into uh, an, a question submitted by Alfonso Gill. He is uh, joining us as well. Okay. Welcome, uh, Dr. Gill. Yes, good to have you with us. He says, could you give us your thoughts about navigation implantology? Where are the limits? It's actually the next slide, and we didn't we didn't we combine didn't this Alfonso. one. Thank you, Alfonso. Alfonso. Yeah. Uh, I know. Uh, well. Uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, you. You have two types of of surgical guy or of uh, surgical aid kits for you to help place an implant. You have the so-called in the literature the static guided surgery. That is the traditional one. It means it's it's a surgical guide that you see from the lab after you plan your cases. Or you have the other way around. That is the let me show you. That is the uh, let me pass here. That it's the dynamic, the dynamic navigation systems, okay? The dynamic navigation system, the dynamic navigation systems is the early idea of a, a robotic thing. Meaning that uh, you know you have your drilling hand that is guided by the uh, the, the a reference point, and you can actually uh, see uh, live by a computer where you are drilling in relation to what you plan. That is called the navigation systems. Well, mm -hmm. the navigation systems are not used, you know, by everybody because it's harder to get access to those machines. So uh, they're, they're not uh, ma many dentists who do navigation systems. But uh, one of the interesting problems was if the all of these deviations that I spoke to you were corrected by this dynamic guided surgery, okay? And if you go to the literature, uh, you're probably having the same deviation uh, points as you have on the static guided guided surgery meaning that you know there's still some error on the navigation system now if you compare the upper one which is the static dynamic guided surgery with the lower one the dynamic you see that mostly of these points are uh, are, are, are resemble 1.16 1.12 so we have a deviation in what you plan from what you have but if you stick only to the down to the red to the red uh, squares that is the dynamic guided surgery, you see that different uh, different articles that different research have more or less the same deviations. For example, in 2007 block and 2019 the Charlotte, I hope I'm not misspelling this, mm -hmm. have the same deviation on the apex point. That and this is not the error of of me writing because I, I double check the 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 things. So uh, you have here something that it's a little bit different to answer Alfonso. I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a very good uh, scheme that, uh, that is uh, done by Olivier Cacotillo, uh, 
uh, from the Journal of Orthopedic, that if you sync uh, uh, your static uh, guides against your navigation guides, I think if, uh, if this upper one here, the target, the good trueness, bad precision, if, you, if, the, if the scale was one and a half millimeters here, I would I would place my static guides in here because what because all the literature says to you that the scanner is important the CBCT machine is important the experience of the surgeon is important so if you have all of these things things together you're probably around here I don't know if you see my mouse uh, yeah 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 we see, it. we see it but left uh, calf that's where yeah, we are yeah yeah you're probably here if this is one and a half millimeters deviation so if you have a I don't know if they're bad scanners or bad CVCTs. I don't want to say like this, but uh, <laughs> because I know everybody's going to fall on me. But uh, imagine if you don't have much experience using a, a CVCT or a scanner, you are probably down on what literature said the deviation should be one, 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 one and a half to 1.16 millimeters. But with a navigation system, at least what literature tends to show you is that you probably around here, not, not as, as far as uh, these small dots are here, probably more around here because it's not the deviation were not so big. But, you know, uh, literature tend to show that they're, they're, they have a better precision. They'll have a better precision than, uh, than your static uh, actual guidance. So, uh, Alfonso, I think it's a, 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 a very nice idea to use it. Although obviously for economical reasons, not all dentists have access to, to it's, it's not available for everyone yeah exactly yeah. well andre uh, we're heating up our audience because the questions uh, keep running in now first one from uh, tablas lakha i think you already answered this about how much coronal and apical deviation from planning to execution can one expect i think we just saw that but the follow-up question is what can be done to prevent this using a closed digital workflow will that reduce this well, you you have uh, a lot of articles that you know dig into that problem. How can we be better in terms of of this efficiency? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, one one of the things that uh, uh, it's obviously a downside is when you're comparing single implants to partial implants to full mouth rehabilitation. Okay, so. It's a lot different. The outcomes are a lot different when you, you're speaking in, in each type of rehabilitation process. And the articles, uh, the, the last revisions from clinical oral implant research and from the ITI consensus group from Ali Tamamsa, it clearly states that you know that is a reason for failure depending on the type of rehabilitation. But imagine you're in the single unit rehabilitation, okay? And you want to be sure that you want to reduce those 0 0.3 millimeter, tenths of millimeter to almost to zero. Well, first of all, you know, the precision of the CBCT machine that you have, it's very important. And the precision of the intraoral scanner that you're using, it's very important because you will gonna have a software that will merge all those, all, all these situations. And if you don't have a clear image of the X-ray or if you don't have a good intraoral scanner, then the stitching will all start bad from the beginning, okay? Yeah. But imagine that even that you have in your own office and you have the best CBCT and the best intraoral scan. Then it's a matter of you, of you uh, having your experience hand because the experience, the personal experience is also a factor that you, you will influence uh, if you have a good truthness or precision or not. The guides, the fully digital protocols, won't you allow you to run away uh, much from that one, okay? That's why you only have 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. But eventually, it would be very difficult to reduce that to zero, okay? Uh, we, uh, we haven't seen yet in the literature, but let's, let's hope that someone can reduce that to zero. Yeah. Well, well, one of the things is uh, probably related to stabilizing because immediately uh, Tabres Laka is sending up a follow-up uh, question, which I think is very appropriate because as uh, when we talked earlier, you mentioned that in Portugal, there's a lot of edentulous patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tabres is asking, what is your preferred method for stabilizing surgical guides in an edentulous maxilla or mandible? Yes, it's, it's a fair question and a very nice question. And I think that we don't have to invent nothing here because you have uh, the systematic reviews, especially the, the last one from 2018, that clearly states that the best method, the most precise method 
to uh, stabilize the guide is with stabilizing pins, okay? So uh, if you're on the full mouse rehabilitation, then it's perfect because, you know, the stabilizing pins are actually made for those type of situations. So in my opinion and in my personal experience, I follow that guideline and I have fairly good results that I think that are within the range of, uh, of, uh, of error that the standard guide has. Now, exactly. if you're not falling uh, on the stabilizing guided pins, if you are go mucus supported, or if you're going to bone supported, then you're decreasing uh, your precision, your precision in related to what you plan. So that is very implicit in the literature, and I think that's that's what we should do. Super clear. That's why we do the CEO Just Ask, a, uh, a <laughs> monthly live appointment with a leading expert. And Andre, you're on fire. I'm loving it. And uh, I hope our audience is, does as well. Alfonso Gil is saying thank you with a thumbs up. And Tabrez is thank you, Dr. Chen, with five exclamation marks. So uh, they're obviously very happy. <laughs> We saw a few minutes ago a question from Victor Pallari, our uh, uh, Just Ask expert of last month. And he, has, he is asking, could you explain the relation between vertical dimension of the guide and possible perforation of the sinus membrane in the posterior maxilla implant placement? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I would try to explain, although, uh, you know, literature tends to show that uh, the more posterior you're trying to uh, place a fully guided implant, the more error you, you have. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, studies uh, from the University of Bern, I think from Helcoli and the group of Boozer, they study a lot uh, the influence of, uh, you know, uh, the position of the tools where the position is related to uh, if it is a center incisor or if it's a molar. So we know that, you know, if you have a span on the surgical guide to the molar, you know, by the inherence of being more difficult for the surgeon to place an implant on that area, because you know if you're using a surgical guide and a surgical uh, surgical guide kit, you know that if it's in a posterior area, you know your error will be increased. Now, if yeah. you and, and just to be super clear, Andre, when they study this, they they measured the error against planning, right? Not against yeah. a freehand yeah. alternative, right? Yeah. They just yeah. measured the difference yeah. between what was planned. And yes. how it was executed. Yes, yeah. because if you go uh, freehand, I mean, well, it's not, it's not to be done because I you're mean, not going uh, both in the same month. Uh, the say an, another level. I mean, uh, that, but that is a good question. You know, I, I I think we should go to that question. But before, let me answer to, to yeah, it. yeah. Because, Finish Victor uh, first. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you're uh, placing, uh, uh, if you're doing a drilling preparation. Uh, on the posterior maxilla, you know, where you have short of space, short of limitations, then you have the 0 0.3 to 1.18 error of a guide, you are probably fall down on the 1.18 error. And if you have a drill that, you know, perforates the, the, the inner cortical of the sinus, then you probably will have a perforation on that area. But I don't think, uh, I mean, uh, imagine if you go freehand, uh, Sometimes, you know, when you're in university teaching to students, you know, they, they go by cortical and they pass that inner cortical of the sinus. And that's not the big problem, but for sure they perforate the sinus. So the relation with the digital guide of the perforation, I think it's because you're in a posterior area and you have the error of the guide plus the error of the, the dentist. So it makes sense that you sometimes perforate. Yeah. But uh, uh, going back, so there is a relation, but you say there's mainly a relation I mean, because of the uh, position where we are working, yeah, yeah, and not so much uh, because of the guide. Yes, yeah. I'm not saying that I I don't know if there's a relation to, on the literature. If there's a relation between that, I cannot say because I'm I'm not aware of of, of the article that probably Victor is speaking. But it makes sense for me that you know calculating the error that you have and in, knowing that you will have more error on the posterior that you can perforate the sinus in that way. Okay. Perfect. Well, Victor is writing, uh, thank you very much. Very good comments. In the meantime, Helena Francisco is joining us from oh, Lisbon as great. well. Ferruccio Torcello says hi from Italy. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. Pradeep Kumar Yadalam from uh, Chennai in India as well. So we're really spreading the globe from India to Venezuela to South Africa to Sweden. So uh, good evening, right. everyone, and welcome. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, a question that goes right into the topic, which I think you're very eager to start talking about, Andre, is uh, from Lucas Wa who is writing, Mr. Chen, are you more careful regarding bone overheating, placing your implants navigated, compared to freehand? Thank you and greetings from Germany, he writes. 
yeah, I mean, uh, bone overheating is a uh, is uh, it's always been there, you know, since uh, that, you know, uh, imagine this picture that you have around here. Uh, one of the big discussions is that uh, if I'm doing a drilling protocol on a fully digital workflow, will the bone suffers from excess of heat because I don't have a cooling system that reach down that bone? And it's true, it's true. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the things that may interfere with also integration uh, in the first phase of healing is overheating the bone. I completely agree with that. That's why, you know, uh, you have to have different manners of countering that, that fact, you know, you like for the internal irrigation burrs, you know, you have to open holes on, on your surgical guides. Uh, but it's obviously a concern for the dentist who does this type of, of, uh, of, um, of, of guides. So I would and, be and are you saying it's, it's, it's more of a concern? Yes, I guess I'm, you're concern. saying yes to that. More yes. of a concern. Although, to be fairly honest, you know, uh, although there are some in, in bench research, in animal research, that really indicates that, you know, you have a rise in temperature in bone, you know, you know those uh, 70 degrees that you need for, you know, to start having cell degeneration on the fibroblast, the macrophage, and all those cells that initiates the also integration cascade. Uh, on the clinical level, on the clinical level, then if you're going to see the survival curves of implants placed with fully digital workflows, you don't see a very uh, decreased uh, percentage of survival rates. So although it's in a concern, and although we know that happens, that the cells are going to be damaged with excessive heat, it apparently doesn't affect you know, the uh, also integration, or at least is open to discussion. It's open to discussion if that will influence. But my, my personal opinion, my personal suggestion is that you try to do everything when you're creating a surgical guide to allow you know, uh, the, 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 the physiologic serum to reach the, the, the osteotomy. Mm. Okay, clear tip, clear takeaway, uh, which leads into the next question, Andre. And this, uh, this is coming from uh, Dr. Pradeep Kumayal Dalam from uh, Chennai in India. He is writing, um, tissue guide or bone guided preference? question mark and is drill angulation variation in sleeves still a concern he's looking forward to hear your opinion on that Dr i'm sorry can you repeat the, the last one yeah drill? drill angulation variation in sleeves in sleeves yes yeah. well uh so the, the first question is about tissue guide or bone guide well uh N none of the none of both <laughs> to be none complete. of the above yeah, <laughs> yeah. because uh, you know if if you if you're reading the literature you know that you know the pin guided ones are the best ones then the two supported guides are the best ones then the muka supported guides are you know not so good and the bone supported guides are you know it's, it's not the worst but it's the ones that have more error when you compare one to each other but again. The error sometimes we're talking about statistically significant errors of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, that naturally, uh, you know, it's much better from the freehand. But mm -hmm. from bone supported to, to, to MUCA supported, well, it depends. It depends if uh, I'm doing a surgical a surgery that is flapless. If I'm doing a flapless procedure, then it's obviously that I would prefer a MUCA supported because I don't want to open a major flap. And I did that. You know, on the early days, uh, you know, 10 years ago at NYU where I was formed, we were trying every type of guide. And to do a bony guide, you have to open so much the flap that if you have an indication, it's okay. But just to fit the guide, you know, you have to be careful on that. So yeah. I would prefer, depending on the situation, uh, a MUCA supported guide. But obviously, you know, uh, each case is a case. And, uh, you know, you know the statistic, you just have to, to follow the rules. Yeah. And how, how about the sleeves that he's writing about, the uh, drill angulation variation in the sleeves? Is that still yeah. a concern, he says? Yeah, it's still a concern. It's still a concern. You know, the, the drill angulation is what I think that, uh, that Kumar is trying to say. I think it's Kumar, it's good spell. Uh, it's uh, it's when, when you starting to try to place angulated implants, you, that means that you are trying to do angulated sleeve like the one that you see on the image. Actually, this image, you know, the implants are, are parallel. But imagine if you have an implant that's completely angulated on this position. Then what literature is trying to say to you is that you should be careful because you're more inaccurate in those type of sleeves than if the sleeves are all uh, in the correct, all rectilinear, okay? So you, it's, it's, still, it's still a concern 
although uh, they're becoming better. They're becoming better. Uh, it's still a concern now in 2020, but if you compare that with 2009, we're much better than, than, than that. Yeah. yeah, it's good with the, with the fast change of technology and procedures. It's good we keep dating this video eh, because this will stay on YouTube <laughs> forever. By yeah. the way, if you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe to the EEO channel on YouTube because you'll be the first to know when a new video is published or when a new EEO just uh, ask is going live. And then uh, maybe later in the future, if people are watching this video. This is 2020 where we're talking. In the meantime, Lucas Wa, who asked you the question about the uh, heating, says thank you. And we have a new question coming in from Taraba. Tabres Laka. In all on four cases or full mouth rehabilitations, we need to often do bone or crestal reduction. Mm -hmm. Are bone reduction guides predictable in these cases? Well, uh, yes and no. I think I have a picture of it. So, yes so no. they're probably talking about this uh, the bone reduction guides. Uh, well, uh, the bone reduction guides, I mean, uh, it's, it's very difficult to uh, say where the error is. When, when you're comparing an implant, the position of the implant, it's very easy for the softwares to know where the implant was and where the implant is. So when you're matching both of them, you barely easy know the error and the angulation that you miss. Now, to uh, measure if what you prepared on the software against what you cut in real life, it's much more difficult to, to, to know if a drill, if a guide was accurate under for that purpose. Mm -hmm. But one thing I can tell you for sure, bone drilling guides are very helpful in full mouse rehabilitation. Because, you know, when you're doing full mouse rehabilitation, one of the things that you can never do to your patient is that if a patient smiles, and you see the transition between the prosthesis and the bone, okay? That is the worst day for the dentist. You will never get another full mouth case. So if you're in doubt where your osteotomy would be in relation to the smile of the patient and to the, the relation of the biomaterial of the final prosthesis, then go get a bone reduction guy, you know? And you will probably are going to be much accurate if you don't have one. So I cannot say for sure if there are a deviation of 0 0.5 or a deviation of 1.0, because I, I don't know any article that speaks about that, although it may, it may, it may uh, have one or two, but uh, under a social perspective of a dentist who's going to do a treatment, a bone reduction guide is fairly, is fairly better than no reduction guide, so use one. Exactly. Well, very, very clear advice, very clear explanation. We get a few more uh, thank yous. Jan de Lam is saying thank you as well. Wim Slot is joining us from Groningen. And uh, also Ivan Milinkovic is joining us from Belgrade. So uh, good evening and welcome all. We're having a EO Just Ask live with Andre Chen from Lisbon about digital implantology. And, and Andre, I guess I have to ask, well, people should know, but uh, by, by, by now, are you a bit of a, a gadget freak? Uh... Well, normally in my life, I'm not, but with digital dentistry, I am. I am in, in the clinic, you are. Yeah, in the clinical, I am. I mean, I'm yeah. always looking for how to improve because I, I, I know that we can improve this. I know that we can improve this. I know that we can improve these numbers. I know that. But yeah. uh, we're still not there. So uh, when something comes out, I want to be the first to try it in. And I, in that way, yes, I am. <laughs> It's uh, I'm, I'm using it as a little segue into, obviously, people are also tuning in tonight to know the state of the art and the latest and the greatest. And um, Jan de Lam is uh, asking another question, uh, asking um, the use of artificial intelligence in digital implantology. Ooh. Again, super broad term, but, <laughs> but where, where in the workflow uh, could arti artificial intelligence be used? And are you aware of any software or any machines which are doing that? No, I'm not. I'm not aware of. of uh, well, I, I know some, but I don't have experience to to say if they're good or bad. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't have that experience. What I do know is that, uh, for example, in medicine, you know, with robotics, uh, they're much uh, farther advanced than we do in dentistry. I have some yeah. friends that use robotics for, uh, you know, uh, you know, treating you know sur abdominal surgery, and robotics in that sense is well advanced. I mean, someday I hope that we can use that in dentistry as well. Yeah, and and obviously there's a lot of AI used in uh, in imaging eh? in in early recognition of uh, of things. Where in the workflow do you think we we might first see see it pop up? Where could it be of use? If anybody of industry is watching, we might give them a little uh, tip oh, of where they should develop. 
artificial intelligence for sure in treatment plan. And treatment plan is always the first. I mean, this this thing, this guide thing and this digital technology started, you know, with planning, you know, when we had those facial scanners running out and say, whoa, this is amazing. But then you had to do the treatment plan and that's the other story. So I think <laughs> with, the, with, the, with reality, uh, virtual reality, it will all start in treatment plan. And actually it already started. I mean, you have machines now that you can stay at home, take a picture and then a software will recognize what are your problems uh, that you have? You have a, a cavity, a decay, misaligned tools, and then they, they start to do a treatment plan based based on on those pictures. So it always starts on treatment plan, and then it advances. You know. Yeah. So so what can you show us and tell us about the way forward, like the, the fully digital workflow? Well, uh, the fully digital workflow. Uh, it's tricky. It's tricky because uh, it, a lot of people ask me that question. You know, where, what is the future? Where are we going from here? As as I mentioned it, Andre, it's actually coming in from Lucas Wa. He's saying, "Let yeah. me take the opportunity to ask you what two questions. What do you think are the biggest challenges in digital implantology, and what do you predict to be possible in the future?" There it is. Well, uh, I mean, let's let's divide this on the on the static guided surgery, the surgical yeah. guide, the one that I yeah. showed, the one that's in the picture. I mean, yeah. I mean, we can be better accurate with the CBC software's machines, but uh, come on, look look what they are doing. They already have super machines that you know you, you can see almost uh, a tenth of millimeter of a buckle plate on the next ray. They're extremely detailed. The intraoral scanners, I think they, they still have to, to be better. Although, although if you look on the five, the last five years, the the the, the progression was amazing. But I think with this static guided surgery for the last 10 years, research shows that probably will never reach to zero the deviation that you have from the implant. I mean, even if you have all these machines, you still have the human hand that will probably be the responsibility of those 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So if you look for the dynamic navigation, the dynamic navigation is super interesting because you know it's the possibility of you reducing the error live. So I think probably the answer will be on those systems that will be more affordable and you know socially uh, more friendly for the dentist that everybody can have one and then you start to navigate on a real life without the error of your free hand so maybe robotics will have a, an impact on that but you know we're completing speculating on this. Yeah, on yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, uh, but, but but people like that. It's Monday evening. Yeah, at least it's Monday evening. Let, let, let's think, let's see. Let's see what is possible. We we've done a lot of proper science already. You've yeah. referred to a lot of articles as well. It, it relates to the question that Sanya Ranshot, who is joining us from Cape Town, South Africa, is also sending in: Is are you aware of any surgical? epical locators, quote unquote, so that one can have an electronic warning when approaching vital structures. Uh, you mean in implant dentistry? Uh, of course, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I don't know of any of any device that, uh, you know, when you reach, uh, it starts, although obviously navigation systems, uh, you know, you have, if you open a window of a navigation system, you see that you have on the screen on the left side, a target when uh, when you're reaching a, a, a vital structure Boundary. that warns yeah. you. Uh, but other than that, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any device uh, that, that do that. Well, if anybody watching is, please uh, let it know in the comments, right? Post a link, post an article, and uh, we can all get better and smarter as well. Because you quickly, briefly refer to this, uh, in the future, this should be more accessible. Obviously, a lot of this technology, especially if it's new technology, it's a, quite a significant investment. So what if, if we have a global audience, people from around are watching, what would you say would be their, their smartest first investment? Where in your workflow would you start if you want to go on a journey of digitalization? Well, uh, a, a good lab, <laughs> a good lab where you, uh, you know, I think, I think that all of these uh, digital tools are very expensive. Like I was telling you the other day, I mean, you have a digital gadget, but you know that this is good for dentistry, that you have an increase of price of 200% because, you know, dentistry. You mean in, in the market, eh? not as the, the market, dentist, but in the, the suppliers. Yeah, in yeah, the yeah. Supplier. So uh, if you're going to start in digital uh, workflow, uh, obviously, uh, Imagine that you are going to buy everything. You have to have a CBCT machine. You have to have an intraoral scanner, a 3D printer, and uh, 
well, for surgical guides, uh, that's it. That means an investment of almost uh, 1,000 uh, 1, euros, uh, 100,000 100, euros. 100,000, eh? yeah, let's make that clear. 100,000 yeah. euros. Uh, so uh, it may be a lot of money for, uh, for a dentist to start working with digital implantology. So my advice is that if you want to go into digital technology, you don't need to buy all of this stuff. Because you know you have lab technicians and, and, and laboratories that are well very equipped and, and, and can charge you only the price of the guides of this, the, the of the fees that you're using. And you don't have to make all of these things. The same for the X-ray. I mean, you don't have to buy the, the latest technology on the X-ray, but you can go to a center where they have radiology and they do this the, the scan for you. And eventually, if you have all of these things in hand near your office. You can do a very nice treatment plan with digital technology still without having to buy all of this stuff. Okay. Yeah. And then first you get yourself acquainted, you get your workflows adapted, <laughs> exactly. and then maybe at some point then you invest exactly. and you and you own the stuff. Yeah, especially, smart. especially that, Garrett. If if you do not have experience with digital technology, I wouldn't advise you to run and buy the first thing that you see in the market. Okay. Exactly. Just, just try it at first because these things are very expensive. Okay. Yeah, so clear. Clear. Um, we see another question coming in, Andre. It's uh, it's again from Tabres Laka. Thank you for being so active tonight and making use of the fact that we are live. Just ask and uh, get your uh, answers. Um, this is related to a topic we touched on briefly at the start of our hour. Do you think integration of facial scans and intraoral scans is helpful in digital planning of, ca of cases, or the facial scans are not still accurate enough? Which and then second question, <laughs> which software do you prefer for the facial scans? Uh, related to the first two questions, yes and yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so? I, they're a valuable tool for planning. I, yeah. I, 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 I use it, not every day, but I use it a lot. And yes, there's not it's still not accurate. accurate <laughs> they're not still accurate. But imagine the following. Uh, I, uh, imagine your central incisor. You have a problem with your central incisor. And I have the possibility of having a, a photograph, okay? Or having the possibility of having your face that the lab technician can play around to see at least what is your smile line, what is your lateral approach. I'm not talking about integrating the upper maxilla and all of those fancy stuff. No, because that's the part that's not, they're not still accurate. But mm -hmm. uh, the communication between the lab and the dentist becomes better because now I can give a picture, the internal picture, and the facial scanner. I mean, the more information that the lab technician has, you know, the more accurate should be the, 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 the treatment. So in that sense, I think facial scanners are here to help. And you are gonna watch a major shifting also in that direction. I mean, the scanners are not accurate, totally accurate now, but they should be, you know, in a couple of years. When, when it's technology driven, it's, it's, it's a matter of years until they reach, they reach a, a very good accuracy. Uh, I don't know if uh, I mean there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of brands of facial scanners. Yeah, I'm, I'm also thinking we should be careful endorsing yeah. any brands here. But uh, can you refer to any type of software or any where where is I mean, the software yeah. really powerful? I mean, let me say like this: you have, uh, and, and that probably would help the reader understand. You have very uh, expensive facial scanners, but you always but you also have you know, not so expensive on a cell phone scanner that for what you want, that it's uh, help you in the treatment plan would do the job right now. I wouldn't go for a very expensive one because you, you, you are not taking uh, all uh, the things that uh, the scanner will eventually you want the scanner to do. It's yeah. not going to do that. It's still not accurate, but it will help you with the treatment plan. I mean, if, yeah. you, if you have an iPhone, uh, you already have also a 3D scanner. If you, if you can incorporate one camera that works on your cell phone, it's okay. And and again, uh, I think it's important. The message is here, not that the, the smartphone scanner is okay to do professional dental surgery, yeah. but it's a starting point to start with digital, to get experience, to get the workflow going, and then later invest but, in software. But, uh, that's just more just don't get me wrong on, on the facial scan, because, you know, uh, uh, the, you have companies that are using the facial scanners for years 
and and uh, are ahead of other of other other companies. It wouldn't be fair enough to those companies for me to say that you know all scanners are inaccurate. It's not that I'm no. saying. I'm saying that for the proposal that uh, you probably want merging everything with a facial scanner and having a provision already from the facial scanner, you should be careful. You should be careful. That's that's yeah. that's my warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some more questions on accuracy, Andre. Can you ha can you have some more? On whom Yadun is uh, is writing? Um, do you, well, Tabrez is writing. Thank you so much for the advice. And again, three yeah three exclamation marks. So uh, we're making Tabrez and hopefully all our other viewers very happy. On whom is writing? Do you find any difference in terms of accuracy between the CAT cam versus the three D printing technology? We talk a lot about margin errors here uh, tonight. Yes, uh, a lot. I mean, not only me, but uh, you know, in the literature, uh, it's uh, you know, the shift was I started digital technology by doing my guides with a CAD CAM machine, and and even if you have the best CAD CAM machine with five axes, I mean, that you know, drills everything, uh, you cannot have the power of the three D uh, printed layer because all those concavities and convexities will become sharper in the three D printer. So uh, it's if you have one guy that we did we did that that tests a lot of a lot of times. If you have the same guy on a on a CAD CAM machine milling machine, and then you three D printed that guy, you know the difference is I mean it's with naked eye you see the difference, and that you know on the literature will have a direct impact on the precision of these guys. Okay. 3D printed guides are much more precise than the CAD CAM ones. So. If you have a 3D printed machine, I would advise you to, to do the guides on, on a 3D printed machine. Wow, such a clear advice here tonight. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, Alfonso Jill is uh, back with two questions. So uh, uh, stay with me and I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through. Give me a hard time here. <laughs> <laughs> but we love it that you're with us and okay. we love you that you are uh, participating so actively. So um, following up on Tabre's question, do you think airway driven treatment planning will have room in digital implantology? Uh, and the follow up question he types immediately after that is patients with breathing disorders might benefit from biofunctional planning to improve jaw relation and airway yeah. function. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if my wife, she is watching this, my wife, she's an orthodontist. She loves that, that area. And uh, it's obviously that, you know, uh, I, I don't know if the airway breathing uh, protocol, uh, if it will improve, you know, uh, and the accuracy of surgical guides, but for sure it will improve the patient's style of life and the patient's, you know, uh, how the patient socially lives. Because, you know, by shifting the maxillary uh, mandibular position, you know, in a different, uh, in a different way with all of those uh, digital appliances, you're actually favoring, you know, breathing protocols and that we know that have a direct impact on also on tooth position and obviously on the general metabolism of the patient. So I think digital protocols are, it's not, it's not that they will, it's that they are helping all these kind of patients, these kind of patients, for sure, for sure. Very good. Fantastic. Very clear. Thank you very much. Um, Andre, we're, we're, we're nearing the end of our uh, of our hour, I guess. And, and what I would like to do, and I, I see you're on fire. You're literally on fire. You're in a hot I room. Love this topic, well. I mean, I could stand here all evening, talk about this. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But but what would you say is, is, if it is up to you, what is the key takeaway messages that you want people to take away from this session tonight? What should they underline in all the notes they have been taking tonight? Uh, I mean, uh, the notes that I want, you know, the audience to take is that uh, when you're thinking about using a surgical guide, uh, you're having a device that will help you to place the implant on the proper and the correct prostodontic position. So even if you're just pilot drilling guided or just, you know, halfway guided, as the literature says, I mean, you just use the guide just to pinpoint the position where the central fossa of your, of your tooth are, you are already gaining in relation to your free hand. You can be the best surgeon in, in town, for sure you can do implants with your eye closed, but if you're fair enough and you see your cases with and without the surgical guide, even the smallest and the simple surgical guide, your cases will be much better if you have a reference of your prostodontic position. And that is for sure. So if, if you're talking about the 0 0.3 error, 0 0.5 error, okay, let's discuss that. But remember that if you have a guide comparing to no have a guide, 
you're clearly on the right track. So my advice is that try to use a guide. It's not that expensive. It's not, you, you have a small more treatment plan to do, but at the end, the patient will benefit from this, from this position. Wow. Very strong. Thank you for coming on so strong and underlining that very clearly, Andre Chen. Um, now, I'm really enjoying this talk. How is this for you tonight? Perfect. I, uh, perfect, I've been playing yeah? a lot and I think the light, uh, it's still helping, no? It's, it's still I, perfect. But um, Andre, we just figured out about uh, 15 minutes before we started tonight that in October 5 to 11, we might be chatting again. So for anyone who joined late or who haven't saved the date yet, put your diaries out now and block October 5th to 11th every evening seven days of exclusive scientific content and in those seven days there's four days of interactive live shows a little bit like tonight but much broader than that there's q a sessions there's debate there's discussion so make sure that you are joining us and if you are an up-to-date eo member this online the eo digital days are fully free to you if you're now taking thinking wait a second i'm not an eo member yet <laughs> Be assured, there is an EO Digital Today's membership rate and a specific rate for this uh, event that will make you uh, make it able for you to join this event and much more. So if you haven't done so, head over to eao.org or look in the description of this YouTube video for the link for the EO Digital Days. And uh, well, with that, we're nearing the end of uh, tonight's Just Ask. While we see our audience in the chat already giving you big thumbs up and applause, I would like to thank you as well uh, on behalf of our viewers and the EO. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. And let me refrain also that, uh, I mean, the, the, the European Academy of Austria Integration has done a tremendous work by shifting a, a presential uh, meeting to an online event. And I think the effort uh, is well taken. And I hope, you know, like your words said, I hope everyone can, can attend that, uh, that meeting. Yes, and as a final to do on your list, make sure if you haven't done so, you hit the like and subscribe button on YouTube right now. We are on YouTube. If you hit subscribe, you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. And it also gives you the opportunity, like Andre did, to prepare for this session, to go to all the other EEO Just Ask sessions with all the broad range of topics that we have tonight. This is officially the last EO just asked for the summer. We'll go on a little summer break, but we will be back in September. So uh, we're looking forward to welcome you back again, either on the EO Digital Days, October 5th to 11th, or on another EO Just Ask Live. <laughs>